This is a presentation from Winchester Academy. Let's uh, give a warm welcome to Robin. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's great to be back here. I miss uh, Wapaka very much. We love our place over in uh, Nina on Doty Island. Uh, great neighbors, great neighborhood but uh, it's not as beautiful as here. And uh, also I miss all our friends from, from out here. So it's good to be back. And uh, I'm sorry I missed uh, Marsha Bjornerud's uh, talk uh, early in November. And um, uh, I've heard her speak before, but it's, uh, I, I was sorry to miss that. You all have a great program as always. Uh, oh, Deb, Deb can be here tonight. She and her uh, mom are in uh, Oregon visiting her aunt, her, her mom's sister. And, fell a couple of weeks ago and uh, they just wanted to be out there with her so she sends her love. So let's talk about going to space, going to the moon. Um, there's, there, there's one real picture up here, uh, the others are not. <laughs> <laughs> Only one is a NASA photo, but it is probably one of the most recognized photos ever. Um, it and of course the moon landing are probably the only world events, maybe ever, in our species. This is something that affected the entire world. So that's uh, uh, part of the part of the excitement of the of the whole program to get to the moon. And there's a lot of people interested in getting back to the moon. So let's let's go. Um, why did we want to go? This is uh, back in the 50s. I think primarily we wanted to go. I mean, you know, our species has been staring at the moon for millions of years. Um, gosh, it looks interesting, and uh, it's a nice time keeping peace, but I think we just wanted to go. And if you consider the fact that the Russians also thought, oh, we'd like to go there too, uh, and we were both building lots and lots of rockets, mostly not to go to the moon, mostly to go uh, next door. Uh, but also consider the technical advantages since 1900 until the 1950s and 60s. Uh, the most sophisticated form of transfer, transportation by that by 1900 was a train, and then the car. All the electronics uh, been developed since. So the things that you could do uh, by the mid-century that you couldn't do ever before. Also, there was post-war prosperity. Everybody had TVs and uh, cars. And we also inherited some German rocket scientists who were real, real good at building rockets. And of course, the Soviets also inherited another bunch of uh, uh, German rocket scientists. Werner von Braun was, of course, one of the ones that certainly the most famous. And um, uh, he was a major part of the whole Apollo program. And if you remember the wonderful world colored by Disney, if you're old enough, um, uh, Warren Von Brown worked a lot with Disney to uh, uh, promote space uh, and also Tomorrowland. And just the interest is high. By the way, uh, I will occasionally recommend movies. Uh, I recommend you see Forbidden Planet. You won't learn any science from it, but it is a fantastic movie. It's one of Jack's, uh, Jack's favorite, I know. And it's my favorite, 1956. Uh, by the way, it's on Netflix and beautiful print. <laughs> By the way, I, I do that because as a Methodist Presbyterian, my Christian evangelism kind of sucks. <laughs> but science, uh, science books, movies include on Billy Crane. <laughs> well, the U U.S. was trying to launch a, a satellite into space. We'll talk about that in just a second, but the Russians got there first. October 4th, 1957, they put up Sputnik 1. Uh, and it orbited for three three weeks, beeping. You could pick it up on software, software uh, shortwave radio, so everybody could hear this. And also, it went over our skies. You could watch it at night, which meant if you can throw something from the other side of the world that goes over our house, you can put it in our backyard too. So it really scared the U.S. to realize, because the Soviets have always been very quiet, and very silent, and secretive about their space program. A little bit later, they launched the first living thing in space, a uh, uh, dog named Laika. Watch October skies. 
it's, if you haven't seen that, it's a wonderful movie about the effect of uh, Sputnik on a young man from coal mining country in uh, West Virginia, I think. Um, by the way, in 62, a piece of Sputnik 4 landed in downtown Manitowoc. And so now every year they get a Sputnik Fest. The next one is September 12th. And I recommend you go. I haven't been. I will be this, uh, this next year. I'll see you there. Remember, they dress for dinner here. <laughs> Prior to the Sputnik launch and uh, during it, uh, the, Vanguard, the Navy program Vanguard was trying to uh, launch satellites. Uh, this is a picture of the rocket, beautiful rocket. But mostly what it did was this. It uh, blew up on, this, on the launch pad. It blew up in the air. Um, uh, the the uh, comedians had a field day. Spadenick, uh, Kaputnik is my favorite. Huh? And of course, it's a terrible embarrassment for the US. And also, they're doing this publicly. The Soviets just kept quiet until they had a success. Uh, here, they publicized everything, which is throughout the space program. This is all very much publicized, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Ah, uh, well, JPL came to the rescue. Uh, they, with the help of Herman Von Braun, put up Explorer 1 a couple of months after Sputnik. Very successful. Uh, lasted for uh, um, several months. It had a very elliptical orbit. It got up to 5,000 miles and very, very high for a, for a satellite. And through that, uh, uh, they discovered the uh, Van Allen radiation belt. So that was one of the first discoveries from in space. Um, uh, later that year, in 58, NASA uh, uh, was created by Congress. These are the logos. Uh, the meatball is the most common one. Later, they forgot how to cross their A's. <laughs> I always liked that one, the noodle, the noodle part. But they, they went, nobody liked it, so they went back to the meatball. By the way, Dr. T. Keith Glennon was the first senior, was the first administrator of NASA. He's not known very well, but I do a shout out to him because uh, T. Keith Glennon the third, his grandson, is a good friend of ours, so yeah. I want to shout out to Grandpa then. Well, speaking of firsts, uh, the first human in space was Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin, I had to pronounce, I had to practice that. He, in April of 61, he did one orbit of the, of the Earth, landed, and of course is uh, one of the great heroes of the Soviet Union, and was the first man in space, not an American. Again, a great embarrassment to the U.S. Speaking of first, the Russian first, they also put the first woman in space. Um, let me see if I can say this. Valentina Vladimirovna Tereshkova, was the first woman in space in 63. She did three days of uh, orbiting the Earth in Vostok 6. Not to be outdone, the US rushed to put a woman in space 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Sally Wright was the first on her to speak. That was great fun. And Guion Bluford was the first African American in space one month later. So, but, you know, I, because everything is very public with NASA, if they had killed a woman, if they had lost a woman, it probably would have been devastating to the program, given how Americans think of things, whether that's good or bad. <coughs> um, probably remember John Kennedy setting the goal to go to the moon and return, return someone safely in 1961. This is the speech that really triggered things to move. So they have the pro program for getting to the moon, three stages, Mercury, uh, Gemini, and Apollo, Mercury was just to get people into space and come back and see how see how the capsule worked, how the rockets worked, and how the people worked. In Gemini, they had to do stuff in space, and we'll talk in detail about that. And of course, Apollo was go to the moon. By the way, I, I entered high school in 1958, so this is my this is my youth. Uh, I love this. They would always bring the, t the TV out into the gym at school so we could watch the Mercury launches. Uh, that's how how in love with the things but, uh, we were. So Mercury, you need to orbit, a, orbit the spacecraft, um, learn about how people function in space, and recover them both. you got to come back safe. They did at least 17 test launches before the first person went up. Um, I would be a little nervous if they did the last test 10 days before uh, Alan Shepard went up. 
But um, then they launched six flights in 24 months, which I think is an amazing, uh, amazingly fast schedule. But they're in a hurry. Uh, they want to get to the moon by 1969. So the first person in space, first American in space, one of my heroes, I always thought Alan Shepard was really the first spaceman, American spaceman. Uh, on May 5th, uh, 61, he went up 15 minutes with a, a suborbital flight just up and down, put into space, and then uh, uh, then was recovered in, in the ocean. Um, typical of uh, the, the, the Mercury program is mostly launched on ICBMs, really. This is a, uh, an atlas, I think an atlas. Anyway, it's one that it would have had something else on the nose of it uh, aimed, uh, aimed toward Russia, but they used the, the Russian the, uh, missile for launching. They also uh, recovered at sea. The U.S. always recovered capsules at sea. Uh, things were public anyway, and there's a lot of water around the U.S. Soviets always were recovered over land. They have a lot of land, and you can be, see, you can be quiet about it. So that's uh, the, way, the way the programs went. Uh, uh, Mercury 10 flew, and then uh, uh, John Glenn flew, and Virgin Brown Grissom flew the next Mercury. John Glenn uh, went into orbit, three orbits, three orbits around the Earth on February 12th, 20th, in 62, and became one of the great American heroes, I think quite deservedly. Very, very, very humble man, um, and uh, a good example. He also went into space again when he was 77, uh, I haven't applied, so I'm probably not going to make that. <laughs> he, he, was the, he became the oldest person ever in space. So These are the Mercury flights. They, became long, they got longer and longer as they went on. Uh, Gordon Cooper was the last uh, Mercury flight, and he went for 22 orbits, which is about three days. Then Gemini. Mercury was a success. They were already working on Gemini, because they had to modify the capsule considerably, because they carried two people, Gemini twins. And um, their job was to run missions as long as um, a trip to the moon would be, and come back, of course. They had to learn how to work outside the capsule, and also do the maneuvers <coughs> necessary to dock, to rendezvous and dock in space. That's very tricky, and you'll see a little bit why, why they needed to do that. They had to do that to work the Apollo program. Uh, so the first, uh, the Gemini, uh, the things that they had to do, uh, Ed White became the first American to make a, uh, a trip outside the spacecraft. Unfortunately, a month or two before, a Russian made the first trip outside, the, uh, outside their spacecraft. So another first for the Russian, for the Soviets. Uh, six, seven, uh, rendezvous in space, it's had an endurance record. Gemini 8 uh, did the first docking. Uh, you see a picture of that. And then they established that the radiation wasn't a problem. There was no solar flare during the time, so it wasn't a problem. Uh, solar flares are a really serious radiation problem for, for space travelers. And the uh, capsules they were in is not sufficient shielding, but uh, they lucked out not having a really active sun at the time. And then uh, Buzz Aldrin on the um, crew that you could do work, work on the outside, not just getting out of the craft, but actually do something. Here's Ed White uh, doing the first EVA. Uh, that must be an incredible experience when you're floating above the Earth. And the other picture is of the Agena party vehicle taken from the, from, uh, the Jonah spacecraft. They had to catch, they had to find it first in space, then catch up with it, and then fly formation around it, and the later Apollo 8 actually docked with it. Um, if you see the movie, I recommend First Man, uh, you'll see them do that and the problems they had afterwards. Uh, the really strange thing about, if you want to catch up with something in space, and you're in orbit, you're not you're not at sea, you're not flying in the atmosphere. Due to the physics, if you, if you want to catch up with something, if you speed up, you slow down and go up. Sorry folks, that's the way the physics works. <laughs> so if you need to catch up with something, you have to slow down, 
you drop the orbit and move forward, and then you speed up and come up. So that's what they had to do. That's actually talked about in the movie, but this is a great movie. But uh, uh, successful, so not that done. Now we're going to Apollo. The, um, this diagram on the left, there, this shows the command service module on the, on the left, and then the lunar module, which you remember from all the pictures. Uh, that's the actual lander. There's an artist in section, of course. In the diagram, it shows why they have to rendezvous and dock. See, I'm pointing at my screen now, but that doesn't help. Um, uh, the, the final stage of the rocket contains the command service module, the thing that flies up on the top there. They have to come up, turn around, come back to the rocket, because inside that, that fairing is the lunar, man oh, lunar module for them. They have to come down and dock with it, extract it from the, from the fairing, and then fly off. So that's essential for, it tries, it, the purpose for designing it that way is to send as little iron down to the moon as possible, because you're gonna take a lot of iron, a lot of energy to get it back up into space, whatever you're coming back up into space with. On the, the, mod, the landing module, the thing you know, to the far right is what, well, the whole thing is lands on the moon. The thing on the right is what will stay on the moon. The little black thing on top is really what's going to fly from the surface back up to space to dock with the command service module, which remains in orbit around the moon. So that's the Apollo. You need a big honking rocket that's technical talk. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Werner von Braun that it makes, baby. And uh, this is the most powerful rocket ever built, still. It's the Saturn V. It launched uh, most of the Apollo missions, and uh, uh, it's just massive. Uh, I've got to get down and see that. I think I'm sure that the, uh, the thing lying on its side is uh, down in Houston which is the Center for the Manned Space Program. Um, again, uh, he, this was his baby and um, the brilliant man. Unfortunately, early in the, the before any flights of Apollo took off, um, in January 67, Apollo 1 uh, experienced a fire in the spacecraft. They were doing an all, a pre-launch test. Uh, they had a pure oxygen atmosphere. They had a lot of flammable stuff in the capsule and they couldn't get the hatch open. The spark underneath one of the set seats uh, set the, the insulation on fire, and they were dead within seconds. Unfortunately, not instantly, but within seconds they were dead. Uh, terrible loss for, of course, of course, their family and friends, but also for America. Uh, Virgil Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee had all flown on Mercury flights. By the way, uh, the name of the the test wasn't Apollo 1 at the time, but the family of, their, of the, the, the guys uh, asked it to be named Apollo 1. So the first four flights of Apollo, uh, remember the, the idea is to be in space a long time. So the first one with uh, Shara, Isley, and, Isley and uh, Cunningham orbited the Earth for 10, 10 days. The next one, the first one on Saturn V, uh, Apollo 8 um, actually flew to the moon and orbited the moon, um, 10 lunar orbits for six days and returned. And this is all steps towards landing on the moon, of course. Apollo 9 uh, uh, did the same sort of thing and tested, tested the lunar module. And then Apollo 10, Stafford Cummings Cernan did a full dress rehearsal. They got in the limb, separated, and went down within eight miles of the lunar surface. If they had been naughty, <laughs> and they could have landed, would you have stopped? <laughs> I mean, NASA would have been really ticked at you. <laughs> and uh, they might not get to fly again, but, but they didn't. So, so instead of them, the first ones uh, to the moon uh, would be Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Michael Collins had to stay in the orbiting uh, command service module and wait for him to come home. Uh, on the 20th of July, 69, 
Um, Neil Armstrong sent back from uh, the Sea of Tranquility that the eagle has landed. They, they figure 600,000 people saw the TV broadcast. And a million, yes, excuse me, 600 million people saw the broadcast. Um, because it's not a good picture, but that's that's what you saw. If you remember it, that's what you saw. You saw the you know, poor quality TV as he came down the ladder, lowered the TV camera, turned it on, and then finally stepped on the moon, saying the one small step for, he says, a man. Yeah. No one could hear that. Uh, and one giant leap for mankind. I'm sure that's what he intended. Uh, but he, um, Again, this was a world event. When they when they did a uh, a world tour, the, the three men did a world tour. Uh, Michael Collins said the sign they saw most was "We made it," not that you made it, not that the U.S. made it, but that we made it. And again, I, I submit that's the first uh, world or one event that the world holds in common that humans made it. Uh, by all means, watch the first man. I was made this past year. Basically, Neil Armstrong basically from test pilot to landing on the moon. It's an excellent film, well done. Not just spacey, not just technical, but it's about the human story as well. Also, watch The Dish. Uh, if you haven't seen that, it's a wonderful movie. It's very funny. It's an Australian-made film, and it's about the park radio antenna. Very much a real thing. Uh, that made these TV images possible and during prime time. So they were, NASA wants these things to be publicized, and so they wanted to show the television of the first man on the moon. And they almost didn't, because uh, of problems with uh, uh, linking up with the, with the dish in Australia. Uh, uh, it's a true story. The, the people, the dramatization is a dramatization, but all the essential facts and, and events in there are really, uh, there's one chase kiss at the end and one naughty word, so it's a great family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was, uh, that was, we made it. And I think everybody figured this is the beginning. Because remember, uh, 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 Space Odyssey, Kubrick's Space Odyssey 2001 came out in the 60s. 2001, gee, that was a while back. And it, there was an orbiting uh, uh, space space station in, in the picture, and you know, regular travel to it. There was a Holiday Inn on board the space station, at the restaurant, a little product placement. But uh, it really was the beginning of the end, at least as far as going to the moon, as far as uh, Really us, and since we've beaten the Russians, they no longer had any interest in trying trying to get a, a human on the moon. So watch those two movies. What they do there? Well, they walked on the moon, uh, not just to have been there, but to see what it was like. Could you operate on the moon? Because I mean, if you sink knee deep in the dust, it's going to be pretty tough to do anything. Well, they didn't. They hardly sank at all. The men with their spacesuits on weighed 360 pounds on Earth. Moon has one sixth gravity, so they only weighed 60 pounds up there. So was, uh, when you watch the uh, film, films of uh, this, the uh, astronauts, the astronauts up there, uh, they're hopping, they're bunny hopping around the moon. It's very easy to move around. You have to be a little careful because if you get too rambunctious, you fall and puncture your spacesuit or your your mask. That's bad. Um, they also collected, as all the Apollo landers did. Collect soil and rock samples. Um, uh, they've been investigated. It tell, tells a lot about the origin of the moon, uh, the composition, and some clues as to how the moon might have formed. Um, from Apollo 14 or 15 on, they have never unsealed those sam the samples. They decided to hold those until much later, and they've started to open them now when they have better techniques for. Uh, examining the rocks in the soil. So they're starting to do that now, so they're probably learning to anything. It'll be quiet kind of science. I mean, they're not going to find uh, fossils, but uh, <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Apollo 12 did beautifully, landed quickly. Then Apollo 13, 55 hours into the flight and 200,000 miles away from home, um, one of the oxygen tanks blew up, losing all its oxygen, and it damaged the other oxygen tank. That's what they needed in the command module, uh, the service module. Uh, Lovell sent back to Houston, we have a problem, which is a catch word, not a catch phrase now. Um, this is an actual picture that they took after they separated on the way back to Earth, separated from the service module to re-enter, and you can see the damage there that's blown away, things hanging out. It's a miracle they survived even that, much less coming back. Watch Apollo 13. It's just one of the most amazing movies. Uh, I and probably many of y'all watched as we were waiting to hear from the capsule, because there's a blackout when they come in through the through the atmosphere because they got ions, minus uh, ion cloud around the capsule from the heat uh, blocks any radio transmission. And they were way late radioing back. And everybody, you could see the announcers, Walter Cronkite and others, going. And then, of course, they came through and uh, uh, they were safe. But how, how Opie can make a movie that makes this still <laughs> nail biter. I can't stand it. It's just still agonizing to go through those long sessions. But so watch a Um The rest of them continued. Uh, 14 through 17 were all successful missions. Um, Apollo 15 and the first moon buggy. Um, that must have been fun driving that around. Uh, um, and I think six, one of the other 16 or 17 all said a moon buggy, uh, uh, excuse me, a lunar rover. Uh, and uh, Apollo 17, the last one, uh, finally sent a scientist up there. This is really all a primarily an engineer effort and engineering and discovery. These are pictures of the rocks that they brought back and of the lunar soil. It's called regolith because uh, people like to reserve soil for things that have bacteria and organic matter in it. And of course, there's absolutely none there. Um, the, the, um, the regolith is a mixture of little rocks, small pebbles, and dust. So what did we leave? Well, well, we left the moon. Uh, December 19th, they flew, took off from there. The moon, no human has been back yet. And in the long years, what was that, 47 years, uh, we left footprints, we left flags. We did not claim it in the name of the, of the United States, by the way. Um, uh, they left tire tracks from the rovers. Two signs, they also left a plaque on the uh, on one of the struts of the lunar lander for the Apollo 11 that said, we came in peace for all mankind. The two scientific instruments they left there, because in the upper upper corner is a, a, a retro reflector. They still use that, they, they send la very strong laser beams. It hits that, it reflects, it, the retro reflectors reflects right along the beam, back along the beam, back to where it was sent they can tell how far the moon is by timing, timing the time of flight before you meet, when you, when you turn the light on and uh, receive the, the return signal. Um, they learned from that, besides other things about the movement of the moon, that the moon is receding from the Earth at about an inch and a half a year. That's pretty slow, but it is moving away. So at some point, you won't get total lunar eclipses, to be said. Uh, April 8th, 2024, find out where the path of totality is and go see the lunar eclipse. Uh, it is spectacular. I've seen two now, and they're, they're wonderful. Take grandkids. They should see this. There's thousands of easy, accessible places to go see it. Uh, my brother-in-law said, you can tell people who've seen it and who haven't seen it. They said, did you see the solar eclipse? I think, yeah, well, they saw a partial, they did solar eclipse. And they go, oh, yeah. <laughs> they saw the solar eclipse because it's an oh, yeah yes. um, event. <clears throat> All right. 
Um, you know, it was a busy time in, the, in, the, in America, uh, much less around the world. I won't go through all of this, but this is, by the way, if you want to get mugged on memory lane, go to the web and do timeline for any, any year that you, that you want to pick. And you'll be there for an hour or two, but they include fashions, they include rock and music. Uh, at any rate, when Sputnik and Explorer 1 were going up, uh, Governor I, President Eisenhower sent uh, National Guard troops into Little Rock, Arkansas to escort black children into the integrated schools. Governor Faubus had, had, blocked, had forbidden it. Uh, when uh, Aaron and Shepard were going up, the Freedom Riders on the Bay of Pigs, the disastrous Bay of Pigs in Cuba, um, uh, I guess really critical and surveyor, which was the first soft lander in the U.S., landed. The Cultural Revolution was starting in China and the miniskirt. <laughs> the degradation of Western culture. <laughs> um, and when the Apollo 8 orbited the moon, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. The, the Vietnam War, involvement in the Vietnam War is greatly increasing. Civil rights is hotter and hotter. Um, it's just, it's a busy time. Fortunately, we kept at it, but I think all this combined with uh, actually making it to the moon was the reason we pretty much did something else instead of going back to the moon. <clears throat> we turned our attention to building and flying the shuttle. Very successful. Uh, it's a reusable spacecraft. That's the first that uh, uh, NASA did. And um, flew 135 missions, but fortunately we lost two in tragedies. Um, the uh, Challenger uh, was blown up during uh, during the launch in 86. Um, I think this point this shows a real, a real fault of the public nature of NASA and wanting everybody to uh, watch and enjoy. They had to, put, they decided to put spacecraft as something routine and safe. And you ride a stick of dynamite into the sky and it's not without risk. Um, uh, and I thought it was really foolish that they did the teacher in space. Krista McAuliffe was the first teacher in space and she was on Challenger. Her students got to watch the, the Challenger destroyed. Um, you know, it's, it's a risky business. Um, in the Mercury flights, all those people were, all those guys were te test pilots, you know, which they lost, you know, they're used to the risks. And of course, the Columbia in 2003 uh, was lost, broke up during reentry due to the loss of uh, uh, tiles, uh, insulating tiles on the underside of the wings. But considering 135 missions, uh, I'm not going to say that's acceptable losses, but they, they had an awful lot of success. In the latter years, it helped build and supply the space station, International Space Station, the ISS. Mm -hmm. By the way, this thing is easily seen in the sky. It's about as bright as Jupiter, as, uh, Jupiter or Venus. It's one of the brightest things in the sky, but it, but it moves. So uh, go on the web, type ISS uh, viewing, or when can I see the space station? And it will tell you how to figure out when to look, when and where to look. And believe me, you won't miss it if it's visible in the part of the sky you're looking in. It's real up and it's moving. Uh, this is very much an international uh, uh, spacecraft. It, uh, uh, both uh, other countries have contributed components. They've helped staff it. Uh, and since 2011, the U.S. has not had any rocket that can deliver to the space station. So we paid Russia and now SpaceX to bring things to there. Uh, it's expensive. We pay between 60 and 60 and 90 million dollars per ticket to Russia to launch, uh, to send people up there. Um, very successful. Um, uh, no plans to decommission it. Um, well, why go back to the moon now? There's a lot of interest, and um, why would you be interested now? Before, there was really nothing on the moon that we wanted other than to get there. We had rocks here, we had dust here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we had here that wasn't there, like plants and animals and water and air. Um, easily accessible water. At any rate, 
it's close. If you don't do anything in space um, beyond low Earth orbit, this is the place to do it. For trips to planet, planning on trips to Mars, it's a place with no atmosphere, uh, and um, uh, it's relatively easy to get to. If you can, it's one of those. If you can make it there, you can certainly make it on Mars. But Mars is months away by by uh, man capsule. Uh, so if there's problems, you're closer to home. So you train for Mars there, but also there's the hopes of using it as a way station as you develop facilities on the moon that can provide a place to stay and also hopefully fuel. You can. Um, uh, stop there, tank up, and go on. And so, like having your local uh, uh, quick trip nearby. <laughs> um, and for science, the far side of the moon is a great place to do astronomy. There's no air. The sky is always pitch dark, um, day and night, and uh, you're you're also blocked from any earth shine from the earth, and no radio signals. But radio astronomy is a major part of, the, of astronomy, and you get no interference from uh, American, the, the Earth radio uh, broadcasts. Uh, uh, radio signals travel in straight lines in space. It doesn't bend around anything. We get shortwave radio in, in around around the world because the ionosphere bends the uh, bends the radio wave. But no ionosphere around the Earth around the Moon. There's a lot of solar energy, so you know setting up a source of electricity is good. Uh, of course, it's daylight for two weeks, and it's night for two weeks. And there are resources there. There's water in the form of ice, of course. But uh, there are also minerals. How much, how easy they are to get to, it's one of the reasons they're looking at the rocks and, and regolith to see what they can find. It's possible that uh, um, it would be profitable at some point, not soon, to mine the stuff and return it to Earth. Uh, lithium, the bet powers our, our smartphones, is not a very common element on Earth. Uh, and whether or not it would be profitable to do this, nobody knows yet. But uh, there's a lot of companies that want to be in a position to go, oh yeah, it is possible to turn up uh, when if they can find that out. So the appetite's high. Yes, there's water on the moon. Several probes have shown that there's definitely ice, water ice there. A prime place to look, and that's where uh, everybody's going first nowadays, is the south pole of the, of the moon. Down there, there are craters like this one. Uh, this is the um, Shackleton crater, south pole. Crap Shackleton, remember Shackleton? Yeah. Um, th this, because it's on the south pole, the sunlight never gets to the bottom, hasn't gotten to the bottom of this crater in probably a billion years. So the hope is, they know there's water down there. How much and in what form, they don't know. I mean, it's molecular water. Um, it could be a thin layer, teaser, or it could be chunks. It could be many layers, we don't know. That's one of the reasons their books are going there. And um, this is a two mile deep crater, 12 miles across. And there'll be other craters like this, but this is one of the prime targets for uh, the early uh, exploration of the moon now. Why water? Well, by the time you get to the moon, you're really thirsty. <laughs> but also, if you're gonna have long-term uh, presence on the moon, you need to raise crops. Um, uh, you need the water for whatever kind of industry you set up there. Um, it is really expensive. It costs the U.S. $27,000 a pound to send something to the space station. That's a pint of water and six or six carrots. You know, that's uh, you know, about $4,000 a carrot. Um, I like carrots. Um, you know, it would take $5 million to send me in space without oxygen and life support is to send me up there. Um, I won't ask my wife if I'm worth it. You know, so, some things you don't ask your spouse. <laughs> I'm sure you say, oh yeah, sure. Um, um, if you have water and all the, all the uh, solar energy, uh, you can make fuel. 
the electrolytes of water, you probably did this in high school chemistry class. Uh, you get hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen, of course, is fuel. Oxygen is nice to breathe. It also is part of the fuel. Hydrogen doesn't burn. Excuse the Hindenburg, it burns in air. It has to have oxygen to burn. Um, and so you have to have both of those for, for your fuel, to your rocket. But there's a possibility of making the moon a fueling station for later exploration. This is long in the future, but depending on what's, what's there and how easy it is to work with, um, it could be, you know, in terms of a few decades, who knows, uh, no idea how, how long it might, want, might last. Um, this is the reason that China and uh, in, India, Israel, U.S., and Russia are all interested in going back to the moon. Um, India, um, put a, a second satellite in, in orbit around the moon just this summer. It sent a lander down to the, the surface. Unfortunately, just a few minutes before it landed, they lost contact. But India is very much in this. Um, Israel uh, sent a lander to the moon that uh, did not succeed. Uh, China has, uh, has, pre has had presence there since the early 2000s and has continued development. Um, you know, the moon's not that nice. There's no air, you know. It's dusty. That's a serious problem. It, it, uh, those sharp edge silica grains um, mm. don't want to breathe that stuff, and it sticks to everything. Um, and uh, if you have machinery, uh, that can be a problem too. They've obviously dealt with that because of the rovers that have been operating for a long time. Um, it's hot. It's up 250 degrees Fahrenheit. All the temperatures are Fahrenheit. 250 degrees in the daytime, and at night it drops. 500 degrees to the minus 279. Um, the spacecraft can survive that, and many have. However, that's pretty rough. And down in the, the craters, the Shackleton, the Shackleton crater, the temperature at the bottom of that is below 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, oxygen freezes at a warmer temperature than that, and hydrogen only needs to be a little bit cooler to liquefy. And since you want to have liquid fuel, that's handy, but you've got to operate, your stuff has got to operate in those kinds of temperatures. Um, also, you need shelter from radiation and micrometeorites. Uh, you don't want one of those puncturing your, your shelter or your spacecraft spacesuit. Um, they could do, the, there are many possible designs. One is a, like an earth, earth home where you cover the cover your shelter, you build your shelter, and then you cover it with dirt, regular. Um, you can also possibly occupy some of the lava tubes, which are fairly plentiful on the moon and on Mars. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, probably in Hawaii. Uh, I've been in one of the lava tubes there. They're, they can be quite large, and they often have a nice flat floor where the lava have, has, as it's subsided, formed a nice flat floor when it's solidified. The picture on the left is what's called a skylight. That's on the moon, and it shows you clearly have space underneath there. Um, and it's another possibility, building a shelter there. Okay, is it expensive? Oh yeah, uh, and it's going to stay expensive. Um, you know, we're a long ways from the Jetsons yet. Um, you can see the profile of the. And by the way, this is the percentage of, pardon me, the national budget. It's not uh, not not 100 percent of the national budget. This is five percent at the top of the top of the graph. The height is in the height of the Apollo period, where it's up to four and a half percent of the national budget, which is pretty substantial. And then it dropped uh, quite a bit after the Apollo program came to a close, uh, as it came to a close, and then uh, kept at about one percent during the space shuttle and uh, space station construction. It's now and has been down for most of this decade down to around 1%, um, and uh, is likely to stay there for a bit. It's around, around 20, 21, 20, 20, 21 or so billion dollars. It's a lot of money. And it's at the, it's at the mercy of Congress. Congress controls the budget. I mean, the president, of course, recommends, but it's really the allocation of in the hands of Congress. That's one of the reasons NASA keeps things as public and as positive as possible. Um, 
Well, a half percent get there, get us there. Yeah, maybe, but not fast. President Trump has announced that we should get to the moon by 2024. That is very ambitious. Could we do it? Uh, maybe. Um, probably not with current budget. But most, most people I've heard from that are in position to make good estimates uh, suggest that we need quite a bit more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, at least a couple more billion, uh, which is going to be hard to get, but not impossible. Can we afford it? This is a cultural decision. This is like, do we, should we get a new car or should we get the old one, uh, uh, get a new engine for the old one? Um, can we afford it? I say yes, but it's where do we want to put our money? Our consumer debt, this is not mortgages, this is credit card, uh, student loans, and auto loans. It exceed, now exceeds a trillion dollars, U.S. consumer debt, without mortgages. Uh, auto, auto loans amount to over a trillion dollars in debt. The thing to me that's really scary, the student loan debt is one and a half trillion dollars. How are our people going to pay that back? I mean, many people are struggling with that already. I suggest that's a serious social problem that we have. What we do about it, it's a, it's a cultural decision. And credit card debt is over a trillion. Uh, if you're paying 20% interest on your remaining budget, that's 200 billion we're spending on interest to MasterCard and Citibank and others. They're doing okay. We also spent 200, over $250 billion on alcohol. Um, I contributed to some of that. <laughs> Not a large percentage. Um, but when we're also com spending comparable amounts on entertainment, on cosmetics, on pets. Um, you know, we're not going to give in any of that up, but how much, you know, if we're spending that much on alcohol and these other things that are elected, and we say we can't afford such and such. That's a little hard sell to me, but it's something we need to do as a as a as a group as a as a nation. So, back to the moon. Why are we going back to the moon? Well, nine countries have orbital launch capability. Um, I won't go through them, but I will tell you that it includes Iran and North Korea. Does that make you feel good? Um, uh, lots of friendly countries, of course, of course China, Japan, uh, Israel, um, India. Uh, anyway, um, there are currently 2,000 active satellites orbiting the Earth. Most of them, vast majority, are communication satellites. And uh, putting the communication satellites in orbit is big business. People are making a lot of money off of it. And that's what's spurring a lot of the development of space capability in private, both countries and in private uh, uh, private companies. Um, the U.S., as I said, has no uh, no human launch capability yet. They're, they're working on talking about that in just a minute. Um, and but many com many countries have uh, presence on the moon, and there's eagerness on the part of some of our commercial country companies. Um, mm -hmm. Blue Origin, SpaceX, Boeing. Um, Virgin Galactic to get into space for various reasons. So starting with Jeff, Jeff Bezos, who's Mr. Amazon, You've heard of that, I've, heard, I've, I've given him a lot of money. Um, and he, uh, his company is Blue Origin. They're developing three, they've developed three rockets, they're developing the New Shepard, named after Alan Shepard, is a suborbital flight uh, that's flown many times. Uh, they soon will be human qualified, so they can take passengers into, into space. They charge for that <laughs> $250,000 a ticket, and they've sold or, or they have promises or orders for 600 tickets. They have a lot of money out there, folks. Um, not, I've checked my bank account. I don't think I can do it. But and it's suborbital, so you'll fly into space and then come back, come back to Earth. Um, the New Glenn is their, of course, named after uh, John Glenn. The New Glenn is their re reusable, the, the New Shepard lands itself. That's just amazing. Um, 
the new new Glen will be reusable also. It will have the first stage. And uh, that's a heavy lift. It'll be able to put large objects, including humans, in space. And the Blue Moon is a multi-ton payload to go to the moon lunar surface. Um, and here they are. This is an actual launch of the Blue uh, uh, new the new Shepard. Um, and the new Glen that's in development. That's an artist conception. And artist conception of the Blue Moon, which will be a large lander on the moon, and just as a both a place for instruments, for fuel, for food, supplies, and uh, the use of it, I'm sure, will develop as time goes on. Also really interested in getting into space is SpaceX, Elon Musk, Mr. PayPal, and Tesla, and others. These are two of the richest men on Earth. Uh, uh, they have the Falcon 9. It's a reusable the ground, bottom stage. Uh, first stage is reusable. Um, it's a two-stage rocket. It's been delivering uh, Dragon, uh, the Dragon capsule to the space station for supplies. Not manned yet, but they expect to be uh, human qualified next year. Um, and they'll take a crew of seven in the uh, Dragon spacecraft. <coughs> they did an abort test with the Dragon uh, last Thursday, and uh, successfully. They're developing the Falcon Heavy, which is, will throw a lot of iron into space. It'll be the strong, the the most powerful spaceship since uh, just short of uh, the Saturn V. And then they're developing the Starship, which is, will go interplanetary, not soon. And here's the Falcon 9, very much in, uh, in use. The bottom right is the Dragon and its uh, abort test uh, from last week. The Falcon Heavy is uh, in development, that's artist conception, and the Starship is a mock-up of the uh, that looks really fun. Kind of science fiction-y, but so, so was landing the rocket, having the rocket come back to Earth. That was science fiction until they showed that you could actually do it. Just amazing. NASA is also in the hunt. They're developing the Space Launch System. This will certainly be a collaboration with other countries and private industries. Um, and the, the design will evolve as it's used. Um, It'll be powerful enough to send humans to the moon. Uh, it'll send the Orion crew module. Uh, see a picture of it in a minute. Uh, and the Artemis program is to establish a, uh, a permanent presence on the moon or a long-term presence on the moon. They're going to build a gateway, which is basically a space station around the moon as a way station to the trips to the moon's lunar surface. And then a human landing system, which will take things from the gateway down to the surface and, and back. Um, this is the main cube of the uh, space launch system. Uh, there's people standing underneath it. Uh, on the right, upper right is the uh, uh, development thing of the uh, Orion space capsule, uh, crew capsule, and then a diagram of uh, the future. Um, very ambitious. Uh, it will take a long time to realize all of that, but they're getting started. China is up there. Um, it's already had um, three orbiter landers, the Chang'e 1, 2, and 3. 3 has been up there since 2013 on the surface, on the near side of the moon. Uh, and the little rover, the U-2 rover, which means Jade, Jade Rabbit, Rabbit, not Rabbit, uh, Rabbit, Rabbit, uh, uh, ran around the lunar surface for uh, almost a thousand days. Remember that includes two weeks of night once a month. That's on the lunar near side. Now, early this, this year, they landed near the South Pole. Remember that? Um, it's the first soft landing ever on the far side of the moon. And uh, they put up a relay satellite because of the straight, straight line transmission radio waves. You had to have a satellite that served as a relay satellite to communicate with the Earth. Um, so the Chang'e 4 and Chang'e 4 is on the surface of the, at the south pole of the far side of the moon, and the little U-2, um, yeah, you see in the right-hand picture, uh, it's gone so far uh, 950 feet in 10 lunar days, about nine months, nine of our months. Um, so they're, they're there, and 
when will we get there? I'll wrap up to this. But I think mankind, humankind, will get to the moon uh, in the 20s, in the 2020s. Um, uh, 24 is ambitious for the U.S. to get there. Watch the money. That will be the deciding one of the deciding factors. Um, and it will certainly be done with whoever does it with a lot of help from uh, commercial operations and for um, other countries. Every, every satellite that I worked on was a collaboration of many different countries. Um, and as you explore the moon some more, the question is, can you make money up there? And you can imagine what difference that would make. Who thought you could make money off of mail order stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and don't be surprised if the next feed on the moon are Chinese. They're very aggressive. They had a manned space program for a long time. They had a shuttle. Uh, they, had a, they had a space station for a while. Uh, uh, they're very good and very determined. Uh, they're pretty quiet about their exact plans, but they're getting <coughs> good. So. Uh, we'll be back at the moon, hopefully, in my lifetime. That'd be fun. Uh, but uh, who knows in our grandchildren's lifetime? Uh, what will we see? Colonies on Mars? I kind of suspect so. But then, in 1960, the idea they did that we wouldn't be on Mars by 2000 was ridiculous. Of course we'll be on Mars by 2000. Sorry about that. No. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Wonderful conversation.